A very good morning to all believers here and following us on the internet. Welcome. God bless you. We're doing the Sabbath school on a whole again. So I invite you to follow carefully. We have uh, two important matters to <clears throat> look at as we get going. <clears throat> Both of them may be considered controversial, but it is not a matter of winning an argument. It is a matter of what is truth. So we have to examine the weight of evidence. We are told we are not to go by our feeling or our prejudice but by the weight of evidence. So, we shall pray and proceed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping you on your holy seventh day Sabbath. And we thank you above all for the Lord of the Sabbath, our Savior and Lord, our substitute and surety, our high priest and soon coming King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Grant that in all we think and do and say we shall make you, dear Jesus, the center and the one in the highest position in our thinking. Be with us as we discuss. Give us the control of your spirit in everything. And be with us now in Jesus' name. Amen. First of all, words can be difficult. Language is difficult. And we can all stumble over words. Now, two weeks ago, I took a conciliatory position so as not to prolong an argument over words. But I went back and searched more thoroughly than before. And I want to share my findings with you from the Word of God and hear your thoughts on this matter. So follow me carefully for a minute. The word condemn, from which we get the word condemnation, condemn is the verb, condemnation is the noun, is an English word. The Apostle Paul knew nothing about English. He wrote, in the Greek. So obviously, the 1611 translators translated a certain word in the Greek into an English word. First of all, let's find out from the English dictionary what the word condemn and therefore condemnation means. And I, I found that it has five distinct meanings so interrelated. Collier's Dictionary, the Oxford Dictionary. Listen to these meanings. One, to declare to be guilty of wrongdoing. That's one meaning of condemn or condemnation. To be clear, to declare to be guilty of wrongdoing. Two, to pass an adverse judgment upon a person. To pass an adverse judgment upon a person. Three, to pass sentence upon a person. Four, to inflict a penalty or punishment upon a person. And five, to declare unfit for use or service. You know, you hear that the public health inspectors have just declared a shipment of chicken or broccoli unfit for use. That's one meaning of condemn. So, so in the English, the word condemn has five distinct meanings, though related as the English. Okay. 
to declare to be guilty, to pass an adverse judgment upon, to pass a sentence upon, to inflict a penalty upon, to declare unfit for use. The English word. So my next line of research was this. From what Greek word did the 1611 King James translators arrive at the English word condemn or condemnation? You follow the line of research? The English meaning, because this is an English word. What is the Greek word used in the New Testament that the translators would have translated condemn or condemnation? And that Greek word, the root word, is krima, K-R-I-M-A, krima. It is the root Greek word, and is translated by the translators into judgment, condemnation, damnation, or punishment. The Greek word krima, K-R-I-M-A, which is translated by translators into the English words. Okay. Now, are you following me? I'm seeking to show us that we are not to stumble over words. We have to let the Bible give us the interpretation. So, let's look now at, uh, before we go any further, uh, it was suggested two weeks ago that the meaning of condemn is punishment. And since the punishment is the same, there can't be a greater or lesser condemnation. But as we've seen, it has five distinct though interrelated meanings. And let's see how it is used in the Bible. So we're going to go first of all to, uh, remember the word is quima. That's the word used, for example, by Paul in Romans 5.18. The, obedient, the disobedience of one man. Condemnation came to all men. Greek word quima. The grammar used katakrimos in that particular sentence. Okay, so that's a Greek word. Open your Bibles with me now, therefore, to Luke 23, verse 40. Let's look at how these words are used. Luke 23, verse 40. Luke 23, 40. The thieves on the crosses alongside Jesus. Luke 23, 40. You know, one thief said, if you be the Christ, save yourself. You come, that's the second discussion we have. If saving himself would, would be sin. That's a big discussion. But verse 40. The other thief answering, rebuked the first thief and saying, dost not thou fear God? Seeing thou art in the same condemnation, okay? So here is the Greek word krima, and the same condemnation is the translation here, one thief to the other. Okay. Let's now look at Mark 12, 40. Mark 12, 40. Mark chapter 12, verse 40. Same Greek word, quima, which devour widows' houses, and for pretense make long prayers, these shall receive greater quima, greater damnation, greater condemnation. Okay, quima. Look at James 3 1. James chapter 3 and verse 1. James 3, 1. Greek word crema, again, the word translated by the English translators into judgment or condemnation or damnation or punishment. One Greek word. Listen to James. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Greek word crema. Okay. Let's look at Luke 20, 47. Luke 20, 47. (laughs) 
Same, same thing as uh, the other verse, which devour Luke 20, 47, which devour widows' houses, for sure make long prayers, the same shall receive greater damnation. Greek word. Okay. Now, brings us to an important point. Since in the English, the word has five phases of meaning, but all come from the same one Greek word, crema. And we see how the Bible uses crema. If our position is that crema means only punishment, and therefore, if the punishment is the same, crema is the same, condemnation is the same, even if we take that position, in my search, and I find that we have we come across a difficulty because we are told in Great Controversy 7.3 that after everybody else has suffered and been punished, Satan's punishment will be the greater and will continue the longest. So if, even if the definition for crema is punishment, Satan's punishment is greater. If it is the definition of guilt, his guilt is greater. So we need not stumble over the words. Great Controversy 673 tells us there, 673, Great Controversy. Six, seven, three, great controversy. His Satan's punishment is, is to be far greater than that of those whom he has deceived. After all have perished, who fell by his deceptions, he is still to live and suffer on. This brings us to another concept that sometimes we miss. The punishment for sin is both the period of suffering and the end point of annihilation. And though the end point is the same for all who are lost, the length of suffering varies with the degree of guilt and with the degree of quima. So we need not have stumbled over an English translation of a Greek word now we see how the Bible, in fact, uses it. Am I clear? Okay. Any disagreements? Okay. Uh, Luke 12, 47, 48. Luke 12, 47, 48. Luke 12, 47, 48. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whomsoever much is given, of him shall much be required. And to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. So that ties up that understanding. Uh, the other thing that was thought to be controversial was that we got to the point of looking at Jesus on the cross and the temptations that came to him. And uh, I think Brother Leacock mentioned this weeks or months ago, but it came back again last time. If Jesus had decided to come down from the cross or to use his divine nature, people call that the manifestation of righteous self in inverted commas, people call it that, to save himself, It was said that the great controversy would have been, in inverted commas, to use a colloquial term, mashed up. The question is this. Would that have been sin or not? Some people think it would have been sin. 
Some people think it would not have been sin. Again, it is not a matter of winning an argument. Where is the truth? Because it is important to arrive at truth. Now, I'm going to open up at this point. Those who think it would not have been sin can give their evidences. Those who think it would have been sin can give their evidences concisely, and then we shall proceed. While you're thinking and preparing to come, let me just make a few points that will help. A Pharisee asked Jesus, which commandment is greatest in the law? Now, if you look at the Ten Commandments written on stone, uh, which is the greatest, what did Jesus answer? Jesus said, the first commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. If you look at the written code on stone and don't see love to God and love to fellow man as the root law and only see those Ten Commandments as the law, you make the same mistake as the Pharisees who without loving God tried to keep the ten precepts written on stone call themselves holier than others when they missed love for God. Throwing out points, as soon as anybody's ready, just come to the mic. I'm just throwing out points as you make your mind up to present your evidences for one position or the other. Remember what we're looking at? We are told, and there's a statement in the spirit of prophecy, that, that, that Jesus could have, this is bandied about in Adventism here as well, uh, Jesus, one of the biggest temptations Jesus faced was the temptation to use his divine nature to work a miracle to save himself. And when he was tempted with, if you be the real Christ, come down from the cross and we will believe, there's a statement that he could even then have come down from the cross and leave guilty man to perish, these are ages. Some people say if he had come down from the cross, it would be no sin it would simply a mani would be a manifestation of righteous self. Others say if he had come down from the cross, it would be sin. And uh, that is what we want to cast some light on to arrive at the true position. And while you're thinking I'm throwing out these points that the law of God is the law of love, the law of God is the law of love, and I'm also going to throw in this one while you think, and feel free when I'm finished to make the points either for or against, and then we will, should be able to come to a conclusion. We are told that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God as us, finite, fallen creatures, have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And coming short of the glory of God, God, that charge is over us, and Christ had to remedy that for us. Okay. So coming short of the glory of God, is sin. True or false? True or false? Okay. So if we finite pieces of nothing who are fallen are charged if we come short of the glory with sin. Answer me and if, if you think I'm wrong just bring your evidence, no problem. If God is infinite in love, if he falls short of that infinite standard, is it all right or all wrong? That's my question. Go ahead, Sister Margaret. Good morning, all. Good morning. Um, I think that you have basically answered the question. We have to look at 
God. God is love. The essence of God is love. He is love. And as the two commandments says, you love God with all your heart and with all your mind and everything else and your neighbor as yourself. So it's also said that Jesus could have refused to drink the cup in the garden. We look again too at the origin of sin where Lucifer tried to exalt self. He, looked, he, he was looking out for self. Now, if Christ had indeed not taken the cup, if he had indeed used his divine power to come down off the cross, he would have been looking out for self. And he would not have had faith that God could have worked things out. He would have taken that into his own hands. So, he would have broken, therefore, then the law of love. He would not have loved us as he ought to have loved us. He would not have had that faith in his father. So whatsoever is not of faith is sin. And therefore, if he had sought to take that into his own hands, he would have sinned. What we don't know is what would have happened to the Godhead if that had happened. But we know the act would have, would have, would have resulted in sin. Okay, thank you, Sister Margaret Campbell Leslie. I see now Brother MacLean. Your hand is up. Good morning, church. Good morning. Sister Margaret presented from the perspective of what is not of faith is sin. I think also what is deceitful is sin. I'm looking at John chapter 7. John 7. And I'm starting from verse 11. I want to make my point at verse 12. We John 7? John 7. Mm -hmm. St. John chapter 7. We could start from verse 10. John 7 from verse 10? Yeah. We're going down to 12. And the point I'm making is at the end of 12. But for the context, it reads, But when his brethren were gone up, John 7 verse 10, But when his brethren were gone up, then went he also up, unto the feast, not openly, but as it were, in secret, in secret. Then the Jews sought him at the feast and said, Where is he? And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, for some said, He is a good man. Others says, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. Now we know that God is not a deceiver. But my thought is, if Jesus had come down from the cross, at the point before he died, would that not have been a deception? All right, you heard Brother McLean's question. <clears throat> That's a rhetorical question or a, a discussion question? Or both? Okay. All right, thank you for your contribution. We are, we are hearing before we make certain uh, definitive conclusions. Brother Broom. Good afternoon. Uh, sorry, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Sorry, good morning, sir. Um, we are talking about coming down from the cross, but let's put it to exercising his divinity even in healing. Okay. Coming down from the cross is one thing, but we're talking about exercising. Using his divinity for anything at all. For anything at all. In the plan of redemption. In the plan of redemption. As a human being as on earth. As a human being. Continue. Um, To have exercised his divinity, you were talking about whether or not that is sin or not. But I want to read, I just want to read something from, from what, what, from Jones. Okay, proceed. As to why that exercise, all right, let me read it. To have asserted himself, to have allowed himself to appear, even in righteousness, would have ruined us. Because we who we, who we are only wicked never would have been anything before us but than the ma but then but the manifestation of self. Set before men who are only wicked, manifestation of self, even in defined righteousness as an example to be followed, and you simply make men that much more confirmed in selfishness 
and the wickedness of selfishness. So John's point was not, but what he's not arguing whether or not it's sin, he's saying that he's manifested himself in righteousness. And he's saying that even to manifest himself in righteousness would not have allowed the proper example to be given to humanity because any manifestation of self, according to him, would teach us that to manifest self, which is only our self is only sinful, would not result, would result in sin. So his argument is not whether or not manifestation of his righteous self is sin, but his argument that his manifestation of his righteousness self, self gives us an example in the manifestation of self, and therefore we will not, in that example, we could not be saved. All right, Brother Boom, you have, uh, you have uh, given your contribution, and you have neatly, fancy-footedly, sidestep the question. But let's come back to the question. I see your hands. I'll come, I'll come to you in a minute. Let's come back to the question here in a minute. And let me just broaden it from Gethsemane. From Gethsemane, uh, when Jesus began to feel the terrible separation from his father caused by our sin, feeling the wrath of God and the justice of God, uh, he cried out, is there any way that this cup can pass? Three times. And then at last he said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He's speaking as the man, Christ Jesus. Taking it from there and going right through to the end point. If he had worked any miracle, if he, if he as man had chosen to let his divine nature work a miracle to save him as our savior from going all the way. The question is, could that be done and called righteous? So the next son I ordered, the next son I see is uh, our, our visiting friend, brother Man. Go ahead. Then after that is brother, hope you have the order. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I just want to validate the point that the brother earlier brought into focus. Which brother? What's his name? Broom? Brooms, yes. Um, okay. when, when you said he skillfully sought to establish a point that was beyond the question or did not in, in any way try to attempt to answer the question. Um, but before I go there, let, let me just say this. We know that Christ was the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. And having said that, and that's a stated fact, had Christ in any way been disobedient to that particular plan of salvation, the will of God, that he was indeed the lamb of the south, then obviously it would have been in transgression of the will of God. Now, we would want to term that sin, or maybe we would want to say that it's his choice. But the fact is that he was the one designated, and being designated to go against that designation would have been contrary to the will of God. Now, I don't want to either label it as sin or whether it's a, he would have exercised his choice, but definitely it would have thwarted the plan of salvation. Now, having said all of that, the bottom line to me is had Christ exercised his divinity to save himself, as you earlier stated, it would not have done anything on the part of mankind being in the flesh. As you said, the Bible says, all have sinned and come short. Now, we sin, therefore we have come short. I don't put it the other way around, that we have come short, therefore we have sinned. But because we have sinned, that is the reason why we have come short of the glory of God. Now, had Christ in any way exercised his divinity for the purpose of saving himself, then the charge that Satan brought before God and the entire universe that this law, this divine law, the commandments, as you know, cannot be kept in the flesh, that would have justified the charge. And there is no way that Christ would have exercised his divinity 
in order to prove that the charges that Satan had laid claim to, that it cannot be kept. But Christ kept the law in the flesh. And he, though he was tempted in all points as we are, yet he did not sin. Thus signifying that in the flesh, based on the reliance and submission to God's will, the Holy Spirit, we can also be obedient as Christ was. And that's what he set out to, to really demonstrate before Satan and the unfallen world. That true reliance, true dependence upon his father, that the law that Satan said could not be kept in the flesh, was kept. And he was tempted even more than we are. <laughs> you know, because sometimes we, we sometimes face with a temptation. We think that it's the hardest thing to possibly overcome. Thinking that, you know, we have to give in. But what Christ experienced to me was, was in far, a far more... Um, greater temptation than any of, any of us would face. So, not circumstances, so, so circumventing the, the, the question that you asked, but to me the main focus here, had Christ done that, then the plan of salvation would not have merited us being saved based on the merits of Christ. Thank you. Very well put. Very good contribution. All the contributions so far are very good. What's the question though? What's the question? The question is, would that working of a miracle to save himself or coming down from the cross, I know I mentioned all the things that will mash up and it will be against the will of God and bring you to the point, would it have been sin or not? Floor is you. Who's next? Who's now? Who's next? Who's next? Come to the mic, please. That's the question. We can either say that we can't answer it, or we can say, yes, it was sin, or no, it was not. But we can't leave it hanging. Morning, church. Good morning, sir. Um, I am of the opinion, based on the word of God, that had Christ came down, it would have been sin. Okay. The reality is, is that in the Godhead, there is no self whatsoever. There is no self-exaltation in God. Therefore, if any manifestation was given by Christ, in relation to saving himself by choosing to act of his own divinity would have constituted sin, simple and plain. And the other aspect of, of what we are discussing is that God is love. That love has to do with self-sacrificing love. In other words, God gives all of himself to all of his creatures, and therefore there is no self at all in God. And that is a basic principle that we need to understand. In truth and in fact, I have some brothers who believe that God created the angelic hosts and human beings for his own self-glory. That is a charge that Satan made against God. God has no desire to fulfill in himself creating creatures for his own glory. He creates because he gives all to his creatures. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hold on, brother Boom. You, you had your turn already. You give others a turn before you come back. Uh, who's next then in the, in the back there, I see? Brother Merton Graves. Hi, good morning, brethren. Glad good morning. You. I'm here in Hebrews chapter 10, it is. And verse 7, don't worry. The thought expresses here is that Christ came to do his Father's will. He said, Lo, I come to do thy will. Now, to me, it is, and all your thoughts to me, as you said, are very good thoughts. But in the eternal council, it was settled that the Son of God was pursued, of course, for the redemption of mankind. And the whole length of that path was laid out. He saw it all. He saw everything as laid out. And he knew that man could only be saved by the pursuit of that path that was laid out, and which he claimed he came to do. Any deviation from that plan, which was God's plan, which was the plan of the Godhead, would have not only have gone against the plan, but in so doing, would have constituted, in my mind, sin. Because it is against, it is against the plan of God. And that plan is one plan, is an eternal plan. 
and therefore to break the plan will have been a failure, one, and two, it will have been a manifestation of self, and thus it will have been sin, because any manifestation of um, self is sin. Okay, uh, thank you, Brother Merton. Next hand in the, I, there was another hand, another hand in the back I missed. Who's next then? Sister Joanne? Okay, go ahead. I don't know if this has any bearing, but we are told that sin is the transgression of the law. And we are also told that there's something called the letter of the law and something called the spirit of the law. Christ in and of himself had no personal sin, and therefore to refuse to go through the punishment for sin would not have been sin if we're looking at the letter of the law because death was only pronounced on those who had personal sin. However, if we examine the spirit of the law, which looks at the principle of love that motivates the law, this, love, this spirit of love that is supposed to be God's spirit, then to, to put oneself above someone else goes against the very spirit of the law. And therefore, on that basis, I would have to say it was sin. Although if we look only at the letter of the law and him having no personal sin, we would be concluding that it is not sin. So I think according to the letter, we might say it is not sin, but if we look at the spirit of the law, then it had to have been, it would have been sin. All right, uh, thank you, Sister Joan. Uh, I'm gi giving this quotation from Great Controversy, which expands what you're saying. Listen to this, Great Controversy 493, The Origin of Evil, GC 493. Listen to this, our only definition of sin is that given in the word of God, it is the transgression of the law, semicolon. She doesn't stop, watch it. It is the outworking of a principle at war with the great law of love, which is the foundation of the divine government. You hear that? Our only definition of sin is that given in the word of God is a transgression of the law. And to show that you can't stop there and just look at 10 things written on stones, it is the outworking of a principle at war with the great principle, great law of love, which is the foundation of the divine government. Now, tell me the extent of God's love. It is infinite. Anything short of that infinite love falls short of that infinite love. And Satan is charging God all the thought you, God, put in down about infinite love. If a crisis develops in this universe, I want to see what you're going to do to save your creatures. And we read last week that God would not let it be said that he could have done more to save his creatures. In other words, listen to me carefully. James says, if somebody comes to your house and says they have no food, and you tell them, well, go and pray, and the Lord will work it out. Then you can give them a loaf. If you have one, you can give them half. If you have half, you can give them a quarter. Answer me. You tell the person, go and pray and the Lord will work it out. When you have half a loaf and you can give them a half, would you be, would you be sinning or not? Let me hear you. You'll be sinning because you could have done something up to what you could have done. Now, how many loaves did God have to, to deal with this emergency? An infinite number. So if he had fallen short of using his infinity to save, what is your definition? Turn it out. Brother P, come forward and make your, make your point. Brother Blackman, I want to hear your, your, your point on this. Yes. Did it, and Sister Joan is asking, did God give us half? He had to give us all. When he gave Christ, he gave all heaven. It would have taken all of that to save us, and he couldn't renege from that position. Brother Blackman. Oh, I, I didn't put up my hand. Why? Pardon? I didn't put up my hand. So I know, I know. I know I didn't put up your hand in the air, but I saw it up in your mind. <laughs> well, as you know, uh, well, some examples being used really and truly I don't think really uh, matches a difficult question to answer, but I think that 
Um, one, when Christ in council in heaven made the decision to sacrifice, it was a free choice. And at every step, it was a free choice. And at every step, he could have exercised that choice. And therefore, he was not coerced into making a sacrifice. So, at every step, and when Sister White says he could have turned back and gone back to heaven and so on, it shows that he was not forced to make a sacrifice, but at every point, he made a conscious choice to go ahead with the sacrifice. Now, the question is, if he had turned back, and allow man to perish. I am hearing that he would have sinned. What is clear is that he would have ruined us. He would have messed up the plan of salvation. But in making the choice in his righteous self not to save man, he would not have sinned. That he would your... not have sinned. He would not... Man, he had only... He, he kept back his divine self. He had no wicked self to keep back. So if he manifested his divine righteous self, he could not have sinned. And he was perfect. God is changeless from all eternity in righteousness. Therefore, only righteousness has origin in God. Every action of God has righteousness in its origin. Therefore, in Christ, in his divine self, in his divine righteousness, made the decision to turn back. He would not, in his divine righteousness, have committed sin. It would not have a manifestation of sinful self because he had no sinful self to manifest. If he would, ready, if he would manifest his divine power, his divine... Um, prerequisites and so on, he would not have sinned. He would have ruined us, but not sinned. And therefore, let the discussion continue, sir. I've heard Brother Blackman, but I cannot agree at all for these reasons. I know you don't agree, sir. For these reasons. For these reasons. The divine nature of Christ as God had to be in full agreement with the divine nature of his Father. So, if that divine nature of Christ were to speak, it would say, go ahead. If as a man, Christ was going to use that divine nature as a man to seek escape, as a man, he would be sinning. Because the divine nature of Christ, you are saying, could not sin. I agree. That is why the divine nature of Christ would never have told him, come down. Because it can't sin. It would be in agreement with the Father as well. Because there's no schism of will between the divine natures of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So, when you say, as man, what do you mean? Could you explain for my benefit further? If as a human being, if as a human being, he had chosen to seek to use his divine nature outside of the will of God, that would be sin. But he would not be... You see, the will of God... As I perceive, and you may perceive differently, of course, as I perceive, was not coercing or forcing Jesus as man to make a decision. But the will of God doesn't coerce or force anybody to do good or precisely, evil at all. So. Precisely, but we are dealing with a person who, while taking our sinful, fallen human nature, did not take sinful mind. Uh, pause a minute. What do you mean by sinful mind? I ain't talking about the brain inside here. I ain't talking about the brain. In other words, this is what we mean. In his thinking, Jesus kept our sinful thinking apparatus always submitted to his Father so that his thoughts in content, his thoughts in direction, his thoughts in attitude were always reflective of the Father's will. And in that way, he therefore had the sinless thinking or a sinless mind. If yep. in any way his thinking had gone against his Father's will, it would be sin. I say no, sir. You say no? Yeah. I'm saying, sir, 
he could have he could have chosen not to carry out the father's will because the father's will while it was to save mankind was not a will that he could transgress as sin what yes it could transgress as sin what to exercise the choice to let man perish he would not be sinning well, that, that, okay Okay, all right, brother Blackman. All right, sir. Well, one minute, one minute. No rush, no rush, no rush. Let's go to great controversy. I saw the deserve ages uh, for 115 for a minute. The deserve ages. Uh, deserve ages 415, the foreshadowing of the cross. Standard paging. Uh, the disciples had told Jesus, Thou art the Son of the living God. And it begins in this middle passage Now the time has come for the veil that hides the future to be withdrawn. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Speechless with grief and amazement, the disciples listened. Christ had accepted Peter's acknowledgement of him as the Son of God, and now his words pointed to his suffering and death, his words pointing to his suffering and death seemed incomprehensible. Peter could not keep silent. He laid hold upon his master as if to draw him back from his impending doom, exclaiming, exclaiming Be it far from thee, Lord. This shall not be unto thee. Peter loved his Lord, but Jesus did not commend him for thus manifesting the desire to shield him from suffering. Peter's words were not such as would be a help and solace to Jesus in the great trial before him. They were not in harmony with God's purpose of grace toward a lost world nor with the lesson of self-sacrifice that Jesus had come to teach by his own example. Peter did not desire to see the cross in the work of Christ. The impression which his words would, would make was directly opposed to that which Christ desired to make on the minds of his followers. And the Savior was moved to utter one of his sternest rebukes that ever fell from his lips. Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God but those that be of men. Satan was trying to discourage Jesus and turn him from his mission. And Peter, in his blind love, was giving voice to the temptation. The prince of evil was the author of the thought. If this, this thought is a righteous thought, that the prince of evil is the author of, in Peter's mind to save Jesus from the cross, I would like to know. His instigation was behind that impulsive appeal. In the wilderness, Satan had offered Christ the dominion of the world on condition of forsaking the path of sacrifice. Now he was presenting of humiliation and sacrifice. Now he was presenting the same temptation to the disciple of Christ. He was seeking to fix Peter's gaze upon the earthly glory that he might not behold the cross to which Christ had desired to turn his eyes. And through Peter, Satan was again pressing the temptation upon Jesus. But the Savior, he did it not. His thought was for his disciple. Satan had interposed between Peter and his master that the heart of the disciple might not be touched at the vision of Christ's humiliation for him. The words of Christ were spoken not to Peter, but to, one who was trying, to the one who was trying to separate him from his Redeemer. Get thee behind me, Satan. No longer interpose between me and my erring servant. Let me come face to face with Peter that I may reveal to him the mystery of my love. To me, this is clear that any attempt by anybody for Jesus not to make that infinite sacrifice would be against the will of God. And to tell me that to be against the will of God is not sin when sin is the outworking of a principle at war against infinite love and God is exercising infinite love and you're not going to go in harmony with that infinite love and it's not sin is beyond my comprehension.
Yes, brother Batman. Yes, sir. The plan of salvation as devised in heaven was an agreement between the Father and the Son, right? Yes. Good. That plan, which was devised to save man, was a plan which the Son agreed to. But it was a plan which, and I'm talking about my understanding, obviously not yours. The plan which was agreed to by the Son, which that plan encompasses saving mankind, that plan, the Son could, it was not God's will in the sense of the Ten Commandments, that plan that they agreed to, they agreed to with the consent of the Son, and it meant that the Son could withdraw from that at any point in time because it would not be impinging upon any of the principles of the Ten Commandments. Wrong, sir. The principles of the Ten Commandments are infinite love. I have no problem you with that. You are keeping the Ten Commandments away from God's love. No, and no. And therefore you no, are no. No, no, no. flawed I'm in your argument. No, I'm saying to you, sir, and I, I don't want to get into a fraud already, but I'm saying to you that the plan of salvation, the plan of salvation was something, and I, I don't have the quotations now. I didn't expect to be part of this discussion anyway. But the plan of salvation, I'm arguing, when the son agreed to it, it was something that he could withdraw at by choice at any time. That is so for anybody and anything. Just a minute. So it's not a point. Just a minute. Just a minute. He could withdraw at any point in time. The plan of salvation to save mankind was a plan that was devised in eternity for seeing man would sin. Now I'm saying that the plan of salvation was one, Christ righteous divine self he in his righteous divine self could have turned away from it and leave mankind to perish and in doing that he would not have transgressed the law of god however you however broad you define it he would not have transgressed it because he would not have manifest any sinful self he would not have, it, as Eddie Jones puts it, he would have, in manifesting his divine self, he would have ruined us. Sister White, in all of her readings that I've seen, that I have seen, obviously I've not seen all, have seen, have never indicated that he would have sinned had he turned away from it. She's made the point constantly that up to Calvary, Christ could have turned away, showing the choice that he had from the beginning and at every step he could turn away. And if the mere fact that he could turn away, exercising his choice, it meant, and go back to his father, it meant that in fact, in doing that, while it would have left us lost forever, he would not have sinned. He would have kept his divine righteous self. I thank you, sir. Okay, sir, that's your thought. I can never agree to it. Next. But that's your thought. Okay. Um, Christ is our example. Everybody agrees that Christ is our example. If Christ is our example, then him going to the cross and turning back, what example would he have been for us? Thank you, uh, Brother... Well, my, my, my understanding is it would be a bad example. Other Pleasant. people say it would be a righteous example. Go ahead, Brother Bruce. Pleasant Sabbath to all. Yes, sir. Brother Patrick speaks about a plan. Mm -hmm. What was the foundation and basis of that plan that was chronicled in the book of Zechariah? Infinite love. Love. To go, against, to go against that plan, you are telling me would not be sin? Listen to me. When, we have, when you look at the great controversy and the charges that were made against God, 
You understand how, how Satan would have behaved? You see what he tell you? You see what he tell you? You see what he tell you? He don't make no sacrifices for nobody. It's amazing to hear these things. You asked last week what law he would have broken. I replied the law of love. He would have broken the law of love. That's that right. is sin. Better boom. Um, I just want to read Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Go ahead. It says, Who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself. So, the principle here is that Christ emptied himself. In this whole plan of salvation, it was not only this world that was to be secured, but it was to be the whole universe that God had created was to be secured against sin. And it is in the act of Christ emptying himself that secured the whole world against the whole heaven, universe. The whole universe against sin. Now, I know everybody is curtain with Christ coming down from the cross. But I am saying any manifestation of self would have destroyed the purpose of Christ saving man, even if it was to heal of his own self. So that is why Christ said, of my own self, I can, I do, can nothing. do nothing. Even to heal, even to use his divinity to heal without the Father working through him would have, not, would, have fit, would have caused the plan of salvation to fail because Satan could have said that he used the power outside. He, he used himself in the struggle against sin. So that too is something that we are to watch because people believe this coming down is one thing, but people believe that somehow Christ used himself in the whole exercise and in this whole work of salvation. But the work of salvation is that there is to be no manifestation of self in dealing with, in, in dealing with this problem of sin, neither in me in nor with, in Christ. In dealing with anything. In dealing with anything. So the principle of God. God is self-sacrificing love. The principle of God. And this is because listen to John 17. I and them and thou and me that we may be made perfect in one. And that oneness of the Godhead, both in purpose, it has to be in purpose. Because there would have to be a division in the Godhead if Christ decided to, 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 to move outside of what God's, of, of the agreement. And the agreement was not God making an agreement with Christ, you know. It was Christ going to the Father and telling the Father, I will be the sacrifice. Not God calling the Father, calling the Son and telling him, come, I want you to be a sacrifice. The Son covenanted with the Father to be the sacrifice in this, in this whole exercise. So Christ going against that sacrifice would be breaking a covenant, and it would have been a covenant of love. So the, the, the problem is not so... You see, I want people to... I, to me... That is a big thing coming down from the cross. But things like men on the earth and seeing suffering. You think that when Christ saw suffering, that he didn't long to heal everybody, see? When Christ was dying, Sister White says that Christ could have poured life from himself. That he could refuse even to die on the cross. But this text says he emptied himself. And that's the point in there. Thank you. In the back, I see... Who? Am I missing? Sister Louise. Pardon? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. For those who don't, mean, my name is, don't know me, my name is Louise Jordan. Uh, thank Returning you. Returning after four years. Thank you. I'm using the very text you used at the opening, Luke 23, 40. Luke 23, 40. Mm -hmm. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, 
seeing thou are in the same condemnation. Now, if Jesus did not make it to the cross, I don't think this thief would have made it. He actually covenanted to go all the way because there's someone right at the end of this experience. And he could not stop short. I wanted to say, though, this thief said, Dost thou fear God? Do not fear God. God wants us to fear him, and that's the third angel, the three angels' messages. And I want to tell the church this morning that God wants us to fear him. And fear doesn't mean love him like how we say it. It means we have to be afraid of our condition in God's presence. And it's extremely sinful and about to be spewed out because we're in a Laodicean condition. And I want the church to know that. As much as we're seeing the cross at this point, and we're ifing and those things, he has gone to the cross. And he's no longer on the cross. He has resurrected. And we need that resurrection life to bring us out of our misery as Laodiceans. Thank you. And I want to say this one last thing. I did not go away from this church for four years for nothing. I sat here, um, those who are speaking, I sat here from the origin of this movement. And I loved God's character. I wanted that character. And I didn't sit in silence. That was my whole prayer. And I know that God took me from here and he brought me back. And he brought me back with a message. We've been here for over 30 years. And if we are living according to Christ's example, at 30 years he began his ministry as a movement, we should have already begun our ministry in 2014, if we originated in 1984. And there are things I could not have seen if I had stayed here. Do not ask me why God chose me or why he didn't or whatever. That's not the point. The point is he brought me here back. He brought me back here. And he brought me with something to tell you. And I must tell you, when things are burning on your heart, you must say. Okay? So I want to say that God, if we are studying the way we are supposed to, God is calling and he's calling in an order. He has priests. He has Levites. He has 11 of our workers. We are at the point where the judgment has already begun. That's what we are studying in a camp book. God is vindicated by the atonement and the judgment. The judgment of the living has already occurred. God has started a new work already. We are bypassed. And we sit here and we discuss. And I'm sure that every single one sitting in these pews knows that something is wrong, not only in the church, in the world. And the call goes out to this movement right up until November 9, 2019. And I want you to remember that date. That is God's call to this church. For those individuals, I'm not saying leadership, because leadership has already been bypassed. God is speaking to us as individuals. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice. And I heard that this morning, even from the song service. God bless you. Okay. Well, uh, we just have about five more minutes. Another hand. I, I saw another hand. Brother who? Sinclair. And then Brother, Mer Brother Sinclair and I, Brother Merton, have you finished there? Okay. Morning, brethren. Morning. There's one text that <clears throat> in the Old Testament that I hold to, and I believe, we know in the world I talk about Trinity and all and anything, but I hold to the Godhead. There's a passage in Scripture in um, Isaiah 48, verse 16, but I'm going to start from uh, 42. It said here, Harven unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my call, I am he. I am the first and I am the last. My hand also has flayed the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has spanned the heavens. When they called them, they stood up. All the assembly of seven are here, which among them have declared these things. The Lord has loved him, he will do pleasure. Um, even I have spoken, yet I have called him. I have brought him, and he shall make his way prosperous. Come ye near unto me, hear he this. I have not spoken a secret from the beginning, for the time that it was, there am I. I know the Lord God and his spirit has sent me. When the fullness of time have gone, God sent forth his son. One thing also I believe in the, in the Godhead, that the Godhead have one divine nature that consists of three of them and one divine life. And, and also John 4 said, I, I, um, 
I am a father, and a father me. The words I speak on the day, I speak not of myself, but the father that dwelleth me do the works. So he was surrendered to his father completely. And he want us now to be surrendered to his son completely, so that our wills will merge into his wills, our thoughts are brought into captivity, and we are living by his life. And once we have that principle in our hearts, we should got the problems. Because all our problems are the foot of the cross. Thank you. Okay. Uh, all right. Last point. Well, I was sat and listened to what was said. I heard about the Patrick, and my, I have a direct thinking to his. But this is what concerns me. He reminded me as he was not well. I had a thought as he spoke. You know, um, in Gethsemane, I believe probably to at Calvary, it said that Christ even then could have and uh, returned to his father. Is that phrase, the expression of all of that, he could return to his father? Um, we said it was sin. Yet, why did she include that little phrase? That what phrase uh, disturbed me a bit. Not now, for a while, it has been my mind. If he had just given a cup, he could still have returned to the father. Could you explain that briefly to me? Um, despite doing that, he still could have returned to his father or to heaven. Well, our time is gone, but let me just start touch on it briefly. You will see Sister White making certain statements which are made to stress a point. The point being stressed here that it was entirely voluntary on his part to come all the way. And she was not saying he could have returned in righteousness. The statement was to illustrate that this was no force program. This was the outworking of self-sacrificing love, which is always free and voluntarily. If he could not have returned, it would mean nothing. It was a forced program. The fact that he could have returned meant it was voluntarily and free self-sacrificing love all the way, which is the law of God. That's all she means to say. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. We, we, we'll have to wrap up. Uh, Sister Louise mentioned that the judgment of the living has begun, but that is not true, and we don't believe that. Judgment of the living will begin at the start of the final events, and the loud cry has not begun as yet. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother uh, Smith. That's it then. Uh, we wrap up. We come next time. Sister Grimes. Yes, good morning. Good morning. I would just like to read this passage from Deserve It. Where is it? You might hear him. Okay. Um, I am going to read it. All heaven heard the challenge. He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross, and we will believe him. The, never in outward appearance could humanity descend lower than this, but Satan saw that his disguise was torn away, that the character he had tried to fasten on Christ was fastened on himself. It was as if he had the second time fallen from heaven. He had acted out of his own attributes after the crucifixion. He saw that he had overreached himself, the charges he had made against Christ were made against God himself. So I would say that, yes, it would have been sin, because what Satan, he would have done what Satan wanted him to do. Okay, well, we, 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 thank you. We'll stop there. Uh, some of the points that were made, we will wrap up and move on next time when we continue our Sabbath school on the whole. Thank you. God bless. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our Sabbath school on the whole, the point shared, the freedom of discussion. Guide us in arriving at truth, which is all important. As we said earlier, it is not about winning an argument for self. It is about what is really the truth. 
And these matters we must iron out before the great final storm begins, when every point of doctrine will be cross-examined by Babylonian lawyers. Give us the mind, the humility of Christ, and may we diligently search and pray, and you will guide us into one position of truth. We thank you. Bless us now as we get ready for the third session of the, for the second session of the day. In Jesus' name we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.